So the first one is that by definition we're saying security when we are defining security, we're defining it as security in the presence of an arbitrary environment. And basically it's any, any adversary that I can write in, in such a pi calculus. Because if there is an, now if there's a, another protocol that would induce an attack, then basically the idea is that the adversary could, uh, adversary could simulate this protocol. But there's one important hypothesis also when I'm writing kind of thing, is that P1 and P2, as they are written there, they do not share any secret value. And this is important. This is generally due to the fact that the secrets are, um, are modeled using a scope operator. So for instance, uh, typical things, if I want to be more precise, what I'm saying is that, for instance, if I have new SP1, meaning that S is a secret used in P1, which is under a given scope, is secure, and new SP2 is secure, then I would like to conclude that new S, which is now shared between these two protocols, P1, P2, is secure. And this is not true in general. Because this is now, uh, when I'm going under the scope operator, this is not, not anymore a process which is executed really in parallel. It's not a context anymore. So this is, this is different from, from writing that, uh, when I'm writing new S, P1, parallel, P2, it's different from new S, P1 in parallel with new S, P2, where I'm referring to two different values. So this is, this is some important difference. So there's really one hidden hypothesis when I'm saying that this is compositional, is that secrets are not shared. And so there's an easy solution, of course. One could say, well, I want to design protocols. When I'm designing them, I'm making sure that they don't, that two protocols will not share secrets. On the other hand, this is not always realistic. And one particular point where this is not realistic is if I'm using password protocols. Because passwords are entered by the user. Oh, there's this comic strip which comes to the conclusion that over the last 20 years we have successfully trained uh, everyone to use passwords uh, difficult to rem remember for, uh, for humans and easy for computers to break. But basically, the important thing is that indeed we are, our systems are forcing us to use more and more complex passwords using special symbols, having minimum length. And basically what it comes down to is that now users reuse the same passwords for several applications. You generally have two or three passwords that you are recycling and basically you are reusing them for different protocols. So the question we, we are investigating here is that if I have two protocols with the user password P and these protocols are rest and resistant against what is called guessing attacks on this password P, I will explain in, in a moment what this is. Then the um, question is, when I'm now re reusing the same password for both protocols, are they still secure? Are they still resistant against guessing attacks? Oh, in general, this is, this, this, I will show you that this is false. So what is an offline uh, guessing or dictionary attack? It's basically you allow the attacker to interact with one or more sessions of the protocol. This is the first phase where the attacker interacts. And then in the second phase, now the, uh, the attacker will use all the messages that he has recorded, and he will try to make an exhaustive search on the password and check whether he can find out what is the password. So this is slightly different from what is called online guessing attacks, where an attacker would execute one instance of the protocol for each password. We are not considering them here. You can avoid these online guessing attacks with other methods like using a timeout, for instance, after each wrong, uh, wrong guess, making these uh, attacks unfeasible, or blocking the account after five wrong attempts to enter your, your password. There are other means of avoiding them. Okay, so how do we model messages uh, in, uh, in, in, in these protocols? So the idea is um, to say that they are basically abstract terms, like in first order logic. So you have, you have a signature, which is basically a set of, uh, of uh, function symbols. And then you're equipping these function symbols with, uh, with an equational theory, which is giving you some, uh, some equalities. So for instance, uh, here is uh, an example of, uh, of a signature where I have one symbol, well, two symbols for symmetric decryption and symmetric encryption. You also have asymmetric decryption or, and asymmetric encryption for public key cryptography, PK, which is giving you a public key. You have pairing and projections for the first or second component. And then you would model 
things like saying, well, actually, if I'm encrypting a value x with a key y, and I'm decrypting again with the same y, then I'm getting x again. And, and um, if it is actually a pseudo-random uh, permutation, uh, this encryption scheme, then you would also have that if you decrypt a value x with the key y and you encrypt it again, then you would get x again. So this can't, these operations cancel out and you can model projection for pairs and similarly you can model decryption for public key encryption uh, like this. And so you can, you, you get an equality relation like this on the pairs, uh, on, on the terms. Okay, now what we will do is we will look at uh, sequences of terms and they will basically uh, correspond to what an attacker can observe to the knowledge he will gain while interacting with the process. And we will arrange the sequences of terms M1 to Mn into what is called uh, a frame. And this is basically a substitution here together with a set, a sequence of secret names which are here on the scope of N. And we are arranging them in a substitution so that the attacker can now basically access these messages using the variables x1 to xn. And now what we are interested in modeling is uh, actually when two such sequences, two frames are indistinguishable. And this is modeled through what is called static equivalence. So basically we're saying that two such sequences are statically equivalent or indistinguishable from an adversary. If first of all, first of all uh, they should have the same domains, the variables x1 to xn, so that the adversary has the same interface when he's trying to, to distinguish these sequences. And the second thing is that for any term mn, which may contain the variables x1 to xn, well, if they are equal when I'm applying phi1, then they should also be equal when applying phi2 and vice versa. And I have some side conditions basically stating that m and n should not contain the se directly contain the secrets, uh, the secrets n. So the attacker is not allowed to use the secrets n directly unless he can obtain them via manipulations of the variables. So let's look at this little example here. For instance, if I'm taking the sequence where I have an encryption S0 with, uh, with the secret key K, so K here is secret, and I'm also um, explicit, uh, explicitly divulging K here through X2, and on the other one, I'm, uh, on the other side, I'm having a different uh, value S1 that is uh, encrypted. Well, then these uh, frames can be distinguished by an easy test, saying, oh, I, I'm just comparing the decryption of x1 with x2 with the constant s0. This test will hold on the left-hand side, but not on the right-hand side. And if um, I'm taking a different frame where I'm not divulging the key k, well, then these will be actually statically equivalent. There's no way of distinguishing them under the equational theory that I presented on the previous slides. There's no equation that could hold here on the left-hand side that would not hold on the right-hand side and vice versa. So let me uh, now give you a short example of, uh, of a password protocols uh, to show you um, what these protocols look like. So this is the uh, EKE uh, protocol which um, basically wants to establish a secret key R. So what I'm doing here is A is first generating a new key K which is a secret key for asymmetric encryption. So this is for each session I'm generating such a key. Then I'm encrypting, using symmetric key encryption now, the public key corresponding to K under the password W, sending this to B, with sharing W and nothing else. B will generate a fresh symmetric key R, or some random number basically, and will use first asymmetric encryption using this uh, key that it received to encrypt the key R, again encrypting, the, encrypting this with the partial and sending it back. And then A and B will do a three-way a three handshake, basically, generating a fresh nonce, encrypting it with R, sending it to B. B will then uh, encrypt a pair of two nonces, and A and a fresh nonce, and B encrypting it with this fresh key R, and A will send back and B again. So this is kind of, they are making sure that they're both sharing the same key R. And this is actually a protocol that is, that is secure for resistance against guessing, protocol, uh, guessing attacks, as we'll see a bit later. But there's no way of, even if I can guess the password W, I cannot be sure that I guess the right password. So these kind of protocols, I will formalize them in such a variant of the applied pi calculus. So I'm not going through each of it, but they will look like some 
short processes like this. And I'm just, we'll just give you some ideas of the semantics here informally. So what we're doing at the beginning, we're generating two new secrets, K and NA. So this is written as new K and A. This is just saying these are fresh values that are generated and they have a scope. So they don't exist somehow outside of, of this program, this process. When I'm writing out of, of a term, this basically means I'm outputting it. And as a side condition, I'm adding this into the frame, which is what the adversary will record uh, when executing, when interacting with the protocol. And when I'm doing an input, then uh, while well, x1 will be bound to some, uh, some message that the attacker can construct from the frame by applying basically function symbols to these variables. So the attacker can construct new frames, uh, new, new terms, and then, and then there will be an input. And I also have conditionals so I can test whether some equality holds so that I can test whether I'm getting back the expected values. For instance, a nonce that I previously created, uh, like NA in this protocol. And here I'm making these tests, obviously, using the equality modulo the equational theory E. But this is just to give you an idea of, of the semantics of such processes. And this generates an operational semantics. So how can we now, in this framework, model what it means to be resistant against guessing attacks? So this is um, basically a definition that goes back to Baudet uh, in 2005, which was already inspired by some earlier definition. And now what we are saying is that um, such a sequence of messages, such a frame resists against guessing attacks if two situations are indistinguishable. First is I'm saying, well, I'm giving you phi, and I'm, extended it, I'm extending the frame with the password w. And on the other side, I'm extending it with some random, new random uh, value w prime. And this should be indistinguishable. Intuitively, what this means is, well, on the left-hand side, I'm going through my dictionary, and I'm hitting the right password. Uh, on the left-hand side, sorry, I'm hitting the right password. On the right-hand side, I'm making a wrong guess, w prime. But what it says is that basically the adversary does not know if it made the right guess or the wrong guess. There's no test that allows you to verify whether you guessed the right password or not. And this, this is just now basically on frames. And now we can lift this to processes, to protocols, basically saying that uh, for any execution using the operational semantics that I just defined informally, illustrated informally on the previous slide, if I can execute A, the process A, to some B, then the frame corresponding to this process B, phi of B, should resist against guessing attacks according to this definition. That's, that's the basic idea. Now, the first thing is that basically if I'm using processes that don't share anything, well, then uh, I can put safely, I can put them safely into, into parallel. If they're using different passwords, WI, for, for each of the AIs that are different, well, then their parallel composition resists against guessing attacks. And this is actually quite easy to show. This is not a very difficult result. But, however, if I'm using the same password, W, for each of the AIs, then this is not the case anymore. So basically, even if each one resists separately, against so guessing against W, this should not be WI, there's a typo, uh, while well, then their composition with the same password W does not resist uh, against guessing attacks. And there's a quite easy construction to show that this does not hold in, in general. Going back to the EKE protocol that I, I showed you previously, so basically, I can do the first steps that I did before. This is one of the protocols. And then instead of making this three-way handshake, I could actually do it. But at the end, I'll just do an additional step as I'm sending out the password W under the secret R. And this is individually, it's, it's actually secure. And then I'm having a second protocol, which basically, at the end, is still waiting for some nonce encrypted, for instance, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with R. And it's sending back the decryption of what it received with R. Again, individually, this uh, protocol is correct. But now when I'm putting them together, you can actually use the last message here as the input of the second protocol, and you're getting back the password in pl as plain text. And so you have a trivial attack on guessing attack because W will be in your frame. So when you're extending the frame with the right password, you can just check that uh, this variable is equal 
to the variable that has been added. So there's a trivial attack. Oh, okay. So how can we um, avoid, uh, avoid this? Well, there is one solution which, co which consists in, in tagging, actually, protocols that avoid this kind of attacks. So the idea is to suppose that for each protocol we're having a name, we, we are naming the protocol, we're having some protocol identifier. And we also have some free symbol in E for which we don't have any equation, which is H, which you can think of as being a hash function, a kind of idealized hash function where you don't find collisions, you cannot uh, uh, get pre-images. So it's a, it's, it's a good cryptographic hash functions. And then what I'm saying is that if different protocols use different protocol identifiers, if I'm designing them with, with some unique name for the protocol, and if each of the protocols AI uh, resists against guessing attacks on W, well, then I can compose them. But instead of using W, each time I'm using the hash of W and uh, and, the, uh, and the protocol identifier. So this, in some sense, intuitively, uh, these protocols are now using different passwords, but they are computed from a given password, from the same given password. But using these different protocol identifiers, I can add some diversity. And this actually now composes. Okay? But now, just looking at having PIDs, uh, pro such protocol identifiers, it's not sufficient if I want to compose uh, different sessions of the same protocol. Because if this is some, some protocol name, uh, then all the sessions of the same protocol will, of course, share the same, uh, the same protocol identifier. So what we are doing, the idea here is to say, well, we will actually compute a session identifier dynamically. So what we will add is we will add somehow a preliminary phase in which we compute a session identifier. So let me be a little bit more precise now uh, on what is a protocol to be able to talk about sessions. So if I'm having a protocol pi here, I'm supposing that it is uh, actually L different protocols run in parallel, which are the different participants of the protocols. We refer to them as the roles of the, of the protocols. And now I will uh, basically transform this protocol pi into what I'm calling here pi bar. And basically what everybody will do at the beginning of the protocol, it will generate a fresh nonce, N1 to NL. So each role will generate the nonce. And they are making a round of nonce X changes here. So for PI, he will expect a nonce or any term as input from each of the other participants, and it will send out its own nonce NI. And basically then we will use a tag constructed from these nonces, basically just pairing up all the nonces as being the tag that we will use uh, to replace again W with the hash of this tag and W. And so now if I'm taking such a protocol pi, which is resistant against guessing attacks on W, then um, I can basically take uh, a transform protocol pi bar, and I'm taking any number p of instances of these protocols. So I'm taking p times the same protocol up to, up to some renaming of, of fresh values. And when I'm putting them in parallel with the same w, well then again, these will um, resist against guessing attacks. So I have an effective, an eff an effective design methodology to say, just um, verify now one, one session of a protocol, use this transformation, and basically I know that I now can uh, have a protocol that is secure or resists against guessing attacks for an unbounded number of sessions of these protocols, because this holds for, for, any, for any number p of instances of the protocol. I can directly get security for free. Okay, now putting everything together, on the previous slides I showed you how to um, compose different protocols. So I have some inter-protocol composition, and here I've shown you how to compose different sessions of the same protocol. So now you can put these two methodologies together. Uh, if you just apply twice the theorem, you will get some, some, uh, some nested tag with two hash applications. And 
you can also slightly adapt the proofs and show that the more natural tag, we're just taking the hash of the protocol identifier and the dynamically computed hash would also, uh, tag would also, would also work as well. But let me just give you a very rough sketch of how one proves uh, this kind of, of, of theorem. So first, the idea is, well, we're doing it by contradiction. So you assume that there exists some attack trace uh, on, the, on the tagged protocol. So I have a guessing attack on, the, on this trace. Then I will say, OK, let's now look on this attack trace. What are the different tags that have been computed? T1 to Tk. So there's some, protocol, some, some roads that will have the same tags, some, ones, some roads that have, will have different tags. But at least I will look at all of them. And I will group them together according to whether they have the same tag, whether they coincide, or whether, not, or whether they have different tags. So I can group them into buckets of, proto of, of, uh, of roads that have computed the same, the, same, uh, the same tag. And one of the thing is that as each row is actually entering a fresh nonce, this ensures me that each of these buckets has exactly one instance of each row, uh, at most one instance of each row. So they might be each one in a separate bucket, but I know that in one bucket I can never have twice the same, two instances of, of the same role. And next, what I'm showing is that actually um, when I'm having a tag that is based on, uh, on Ti, Hti of uh, W, I can actually replace it by a simpler tag, uh, replacing Ti with some, some, some uh, constant, Sidi. It's just some fresh constant that I'm using. And um, this will actually give me a similar, nearly the same trace, which is also executable, and which still has a guessing attack. But now, this SID is coming is somehow magically shared. So this is completely independent of the previous uh, nonce exchange. I've made a re replacement like this. So I can actually completely chop off this, uh, this preamble that I did to, to, care, to compute a nonce, as long as they are different. And then I can basically use my uh, disjoint composition result, which is now saying that actually, uh, as I'm now here, when I replace it, I, I use a fresh wi and just some constant, I can use the result that I has had on disjoint uh, composition for protocols, conclude that there's, uh, there must be some <coughs> guessing attack on one individual protocol. And lastly, I have shown that actually adding tags does not add any guessing attacks. So there have, must have been some guessing attack on the initial protocol, giving me the contradiction that I wanted. So um, as a conclusion, so we have shown basically how to transform these protocols using tags and to make them compose nicely, in the sense that if I have different protocols, if they are using entering, if they are adding the name of the protocol, then they will compose, and the same also for sessions. I can dynamically compute a session tag and obtain uh, compositional guarantees like this. So basically, we can now just take our, our favorite tool, check one session of a protocol, transform the protocol accordingly, and conclude that it will actually resist against guessing attacks, even if executed in, in an environment with other protocols. Uh, one thing that I should say is now, I have shown this composition for uh, resistance against guessing attacks. But this is generally not the, not the aim of a protocol. If you're running a protocol, you want to have authentication or secrecy or things like that. Resistance or against guessing attacks is just a way to ensure it. So, um, so actually what we need to do is to show this kind of composition for, for other properties. But for instance, for property, properties like authentication or composition, it actually follows for, for any trace property. You should maintain them. So there's, this is still... Uh, ongoing work, but mainly um, the most tedious thing is to, to specify exactly what you, what you mean by authentication. But this should be uh, quite straightforward. A much, much harder thing that we would like to do is to have a composition of more general equivalence properties. Like on the very first slide where I was saying, like, you can express security as a property is indistinguishable from some specification, for instance. If you want to, to compose such general equivalence properties, this is much, much harder. Okay, thank you.